Okay, welcome everybody to Grand Rounds. It is a privilege to have Ilya here with us today. Crazy to think I met Ilya as a fellow when he was a fellow. It's almost 15 years ago now. <laughs> you see he's got his new beautiful building. So he and his brother have started this new Lane Gold Institute for Plastic Surgery up in Meridian. It's awesome to have him close. Uh, Ilya is one of the leading experts literally in the world on corneal neuritization. It is an absolute enjoyment to have you here. Ilya, I'm just going to we're going to turn things over to you and let you get going. Okay. Okay. Hey, perfect. Th thanks, Doug. Really appreciate it. It's an honor, honor to uh, participate in your grand rounds. Let me go ahead and share the screen real quick. Can everyone see this? Okay. Can everyone see this? Doug? Perfect, Delia. Working great. Oh, oh great. <clears throat> well, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to uh, um, present this. Uh, and I think this is um, an, an exciting topic. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot to talk about. I'll, I'll try to hit the main points and um, would like to open the discussion for questions after I finish, just to make sure I uh, address any uh, questions or concern, you know, or uh, inquiries about this uh, procedure. So these are my financial disclosures. So in this um, talk, I'd like to um, go over the indications for the procedure, for corneal neurotization procedure, and describe the available surgical techniques, um, clinical outcomes of the surgery, and also briefly delve into other roles of peripheral nerve surgery in the treatment of other conditions, such as periorbital neuropathic pain. So as we are all familiar, Neurotrophic keratopathy is a degenerative condition of the cornea characterized by decreased or altered corneal sensation. If you research the prevalence of the disease, it is approximately five out of 10,000, but I think it is underestimated. I think a lot of neurotrophic keratopathy is being missed until recently uh, with the development of this surgery, as well as recombinant nerve growth factors, we're paying a little bit more attention to the condition because we can actually do something about it. About 15% about can progress to visually threatening disease where there's corneal melt and even perforation. Uh, we're also, also familiar with the Mackey classification of NK with uh, the first stage being characterized by punctate keratopathy progressing to stage two with persistent or recurrent epithelial defects, neovascularization of the cornea, and then the third stage being manifested by uh, the uh, corneal melt and perforation. The most common ideology that we see in our clinics is due to infectious causes such as herpetic uh, infections, uh, uh, simplex and zoster, but certainly a close second is neurosurgical uh, uh, ideology or uh, intracranial neoplasia. So these are proximal injuries of a trigeminal, trigeminal nerve. Uh, it, another relatively common Situation is where folks have had uh, corneal surgery or they've had retinal procedures <clears throat> such as penretinal photocoagulation uh, injuring their long ciliary nerves. So why does neurotrophic keratopathy occur? Uh, well, this is kind of a simple diagram shows that showing a, a cornea with, with corneal nerves. And in addition to providing uh, reflex tearing, you know, uh, being responsible for the reflex tearing and reflex blink. Uh, the corneal nerves are uh, extremely important in providing nutrients to the epithelium. 
Uh, and uh, in turn, the epithelium supports the corneal nerves. So this interplay is very important uh, to keep healthy corneal epithelium. So how do we diagnose neurotrophic keratopathy? Um, this is becoming more uh, common now uh, uh, since, since um, or, or the use of this tool called Koshibone esthesiometer is becoming more common as we are learning and, and recognizing neurotrophic keratopathy uh, more frequently. Uh, and uh, as um, you uh, may remember, um, the way you check corneal sensation with Koshibone esthesiometer is by using this nylon monofilament and the length of the monofilament is directly proportional to the amount of corneal sensation. So six centimeters is six to five centimeters is relatively normal corneal sensation. And as the monofilament becomes shorter, uh, uh, this correlates to decreased corneal sensation. Uh, through um, sort of my experience and experience of my colleagues, it appears that approximately two centimeter of corneal sensation provides adequate protection to the corneal epithelium preventing uh, persistent or recurrent epithelial defects. We tend to measure the corneal sensation centrally in, in four quadrants of the cornea. So um, the, currently there are multiple temporizing therapies for neurotrophic keratopathy. And um, yeah, most recently uh, there's been development of recombinant nerve growth factor that uh, has been introduced uh, to the market a couple of years ago. But unfortunately, none of these therapies result in uh, proven improvement of corneal sensation. And the durability of uh, the success using these therapies is also questionable. So really what we need to do is to address the underlying cause of the disease or the loss of corneal innervation. So neurotization isn't a novel concept. Uh, neurotization has been utilized in other areas of the body. Uh, essentially, the principle of neurotization is that uh, the peripheral nerves can regenerate and uh, uh, it's possible to use a, an expendable healthy donor nerve to reinnervate a target organ that has lost its innervation. Um, we this this uh, uh, slide kind of summarizes the uh, anatomy of a peripheral nerve. Uh, the the nerve fascicles are uh, enveloped by epineurium, and the nerve fascicles are uh, uh, really the um, kind of the, the workhorse of corneal neurotization. And what I mean by that is that uh, the, the way this works is the, the distal uh, target or the denervated target is innervated by releasing the nerve fascicles from the epineurium and essentially plugging them into the um, tissue, the denervated tissue, in hopes that the axons will eventually grow into the surrounding tissue and find their receptors uh, and, and make meaningful connections with the uh, 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 sensory or motor uh, uh, targets um, on the denervated tissue. So that's kind of the, the principle of the surgery. Um, and uh, that's why we find success due to this meaningful connection between the, the axons and the uh, existing receptors uh, within the denervated target. Um, how do these peripheral nerves regenerate? We learned all of this in our neuroanatomy course. Um, once the, there is injury to the, uh, uh, um, to the uh, axons, the, there's uh, essentially breakdown or degeneration of the distal portion of the nerve uh, via valerian uh, degeneration. Um, and then Schwann cells and macrophages come in, macrophages clean up the debris and prepare the uh, area for uh, proper axonal regeneration. And then Schwann cells then guide axons from the proximal severed end to regenerate towards the target.
Regeneration usually occurs at, at approximately one millimeter per day, but that can vary. You know, in pediatric patients, we see that the re nerve regeneration occurs at a faster rate. Uh, and maybe in older patients, patients with a lot of comorbidities, this may be delayed. Um, the, uh, the, the surgery, the neurotization itself can be uh, accomplished via direct or indirect uh, methods. So uh, direct neurotization basically imply, or what, what that really means is, is you're taking a, an entire uh, donor nerve, so the expendable nerve that's not critical to function, and you're transferring that entire nerve uh, to the target. And, and once you transfer to the target, you release the fascicles or, and or you know, branches of that nerve uh, that, that are bundled together, and then you plug it into the target tissue. With indirect transfer, the donor nerve isn't long enough to reach the target. And so you can use a, an interpositioned nerve graft, either harvested from your own body or, you, or, or taken off the shelf as allograft. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later in the talk. To, uh, to then allow the axons from the donor nerve to grow along that conduit uh, to the target. So the, so the uh, interposition nerve graft really just functions as a bridge or a conduit to allow the, the healthy axons from the donor to grow towards the target. So um, having Kind of describe that background, corneal neurotization essentially is exactly what we talked about is you, you take the uh, healthy expandable nerves. So in this case, it's, you know, this diagram shows the supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves from the other side of the, uh, of the face in this particular diagram uh, and transfer the, uh, these nerves uh, to the cornea. Now, um, if the patient has healthy, intact donor nerves on the same side as the affected cornea, then you can do an ips ipsilateral transfer. You don't have to do a contralateral transfer. And this diagram uh, you know, assumes that the whole trigeminal nerve is out on the, on the right side, and then so the left-sided uh, donor nerves are used. And so once, once uh, those uh, nerves are transferred, uh, then uh, they are essentially uh, uh, placed uh, in the subconjunctival uh, plane around the limbus, and then eventually uh, the axons uh, start growing into the surrounding tissue, you know, in all directions, uh, and then some of the axons end up invading the corneal epithelium, corneal stroma, and many, making meaningful connections with the sensory uh, receptors within the corneal epithelium and with epithelial cells as well. And this shows kind of the cross-section of what is presumed uh, to be happening within the cornea. So um, what are the indications and the preoperative testing for the surgery? So that's a highly debated topic. Uh, I'm going to give you my indications and what I, you know, think uh, through my experience is the um, reason to do the surgery. So uh, I find that uh, neurotrophic keratopathy is a very, uh, uh, very diverse disease process. So there are patients who uh, may have herpetic ideology and um, their corneal sensation isn't uniform throughout the, the, the entire cornea. So they may have areas of hyperesthesia and areas of hypoesthesia, but their overall clinical picture is consistent with NK. And so even though not the entire cornea is denervated and may, they may be some, even some areas of hyperesthesia, that is still an indication for me to go ahead and perform the procedure if they, they're showing signs of NK and the cornea isn't recovering corneal sensation with adequate medical management and follow-up. Um, obviously, you want to have intact uh, donor nerve. So whether it's contralateral, ipsilateral nerve, a sensory nerve that you can transfer to the cornea. 
So if, if there are no available donor nerves, then you, the patient may not you know, be a candidate for the procedure. And certainly patients with uh, certain comorbidities, such as um, you know, poorer health, uh, uh, those who are undergoing radiation, chemotherapy, uh, have active you know, ocular or periocular malignancies, or you know, th those aren't really great uh, candidates for the surgery. Uh, certainly patients with a lot of smoking history, et cetera, uh, should probably be, be avoided uh, as well due to poor uh, nerve regeneration. Uh, so my, my very first case was a patient um, that I saw at University of South Florida when I was my second year of practice. So that was in, uh, or third year in practice, like, or second year in practice in 2013. And uh, she was, you know, referred to me for uh, a tarsorophy uh, because she, she's been treated with all kinds of drops and, and ointments for about a year and a half and continued to have a persistent epithelial defect. And so she was very, very uh, uh, resistant to the idea of having to have surgery uh, to close her eye and asked me if there's anything else I can do for her. And you know, at that point, I, I said, I don't really have anything else to offer you because you've tried everything else that exists. And so we'll have to close your eye, at least partially. And, but then I came home, I started doing my research and I found this paper, it was the only paper that I found published on this topic in uh, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal uh, in 2009. And this was a paper by um, uh, uh, a surgeons from Virginia, uh, uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School, led by Julia Chorzis, who is now retired, but she's a was a well-known uh, uh, nerve surgeon, a plastic surgeon and, and a peripheral nerve surgeon. And uh, she partnered up with one of the ophthalmologists uh, in the in the in that group, and they've performed uh, actually six of these procedures on uh, over a span of um, uh, sixteen years on average, um, and they reported very remarkable outcomes. Where uh, when they transferred the contralateral, supraorbital, supratrochlear nerves, uh, all of these patients except for one have had. In, uh, remarkable restoration of corneal sensation, uh, stabilization of corneal uh, uh, surface with, with no recurrence of epithelial defects, and some of them progressed to, to improved vision. And these patients had you know, proximal injuries to the trigeminal nerve, which uh, uh, with, with no hope of, of spontaneous nerve regeneration. Um, so while these were impressive outcomes, it, you know, it was a quite, a, quite an invasive procedure. You know, the, the essentially these patients underwent a coronal incision, some ear-to-ear -ear incision, a, a skull flap was reflected and the, and the contralateral nerves were harvested and tunneled to the cornea. Um, so I performed a similar procedure and kind of talked to the patient about it. I uh, got permission from my ethics board at the, at the university and the patient did great, and and this is her at two years, and 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 she at three three months I noticed improvement in her corneal sensation as well as um, stabilization of her epithelial defect, and then uh, from then on she remained uh, she remained stable. She, she had no recurrent epi defects. Her cornea cleared up, and um, you know, she went from hand motions to twenty twenty five vision. And I talked to her actually just uh, about six months ago, and it's been, gosh, nine years now, and she's still doing great. So, so definitely, I was I was very impressed. But um, the question was, you know, is there anything that we can do to minimize the morbidity and the extent of this operation uh, to produce and produce similar results? So there, you know, because because there's certainly a number of issues that can arise, you know, from this type of approach as well as patient and, and, and physician acceptability of, of this technique. Luckily, uh, four years later, um, there was another paper that came out of uh, sick kids in Toronto, uh, uh, led by Gregory Borchel, who is a, a, a craniofacially trained plastic surgeon, does a lot of peripheral nerve surgery. And then Asim Ali, who some of you may know, he's a, a, a a cornea specialist, pediatric cornea surgeon, um, has published a lot on, on corneal neurodization with, with Gregory. 
Um, and they've described a technique where they used contralateral or ipsilateral supratrochlear nerves connecting uh, an interposition nerve graft uh, with an end to side fashion to this to the contralateral supratrochlear or in, 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 or ipsilateral, uh, ipsilateral supratrochlear nerve and transferring the nerve graft directly to the affected cornea. And again, the, the nerve graft was used to minimize the morbidity of the operation and the nerve graft uh, just served as a conduit to allow the axons from the supratrochlear nerve to grow along and eventually reach the cornea. And they've reported excellent outcomes in four kids or three kids, four eyes, where the children showed improvement at you know around three months in corneal sensation, and uh, and and they um, uh, stabilized the corneal surface. And in fact, some of these patients even noticed improvement in some of the uh, scarring, although uh, that was variable. Um, and a few of these, uh, and a couple of these kids were able to get a, a deep uh, anterior lamellar keratoplasty uh, successfully. Um, this shows the harvest of the uh, sural nerve that they used as interposition nerve graft. And this shows the cooptation of the sural nerve uh, to the um, uh, to the to the supratrochlear nerve. Um, so this kind of is a schematic diagram. Uh, the only difference here is shows and to and cooptation, but essentially um, here supratrochlear nerve is transected, um, you know, about a centimeter and a half or so uh, above the superior orbital rim through an upper eyelid or subbrow incision. And then a nerve graft is co-opted uh, to the end of, of that uh, nerve and then tunneled under the nasal bridge uh, to the incision uh, below the brow or in the upper eyelid crease medially on the other side and then tunneled uh, through the fornix in the subtenons and eventually subconjunctival plane uh, to the limbus. And then the ends of the uh, nerve, essentially the fascicles, are released here and then uh, they're uh, essentially secured uh, or tunneled uh, uh, around the limbus. Um, they've, they've further modified this technique by doing a corneal scleral tunnels to uh, bury the fascicles for um, uh, increased or improved penetration of the cornea scleral uh, junction. Uh, although again, that's that's a controversial point whether that helps or not. Um, they further describe their outcomes, um, uh, long-term outcomes, uh, uh, in um, uh, believe uh, nineteen uh, patients, where they've uh, reported successful corneal transplantation and stability of the results over the average uh, two years and as long as six-year uh, follow-up. Uh, the one um, criticism, I guess, or downside of this technique is that there is a donor site. And so donor site can have complications such as persistent pain, neuroma formation, et cetera, uh, persistent numbness, loss of protective sensation. And so um, uh, when we looked at this technique, we um, were aware of uh, use of nerve allografts, which are um, uh, off the shelf products uh, from uh, cadavers, essentially it's, an, it's, a, it's a cadaveric nerve that's decellularized and use those nerves to perform the same or similar surgery to see if these patients would achieve similar results. So um, essentially what uh, these nerve uh, allografts are, they're, um, uh, you can see that they, they have this, the, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, of the uh, of our sort of uh, peripheral nerve, except they have no Schwann cells, they don't have any cellular debris. And you can see these are what's called these little openings called endoneural tubes, and they, they allow the axons from the donor to grow through these endoneural tubes uh, to the target in a similar way that the nerve autographs do. Uh, see, it undergoes kind of a, a very uh, uh, 
elaborate uh, cleansing and process of removing debris and growth inhibitors of the nerves. And a lot of animal studies have shown uh, significant improved efficacy, uh, meaning that the, the, there's actually uh, axonal uh, regrowth or growth through these grafts. Although there's a lot of debate whether they work to the same uh, extent or are they, if they're just as good as using the nerve autographs. Uh, they're available in different sizes uh, versus when you harvest a sural nerve graft, you sort of, you know, have what you have. So if you get a two millimeter graft, that's what you have. If you have a three millimeter graft, that's what you have. But with the uh, allograft, you know, you have different diameters and different lengths. I use the longest length possible. Um, the one uh, criticism of using nerve allografts is that you there are no Schwann cells. And so the Schwann cells that you rely on to guide the axonal regeneration are those that are derived from the donor nerve that you're using. Uh, whereas in nerve autograft, the Schwann cells are populated within the graft itself. Uh, so this shows the uh, this uh, surgery. Uh, here I'm using the nerve allograft, and you can see this is end-to-end -end cooptation with the supraorbital nerve that I've dissected through an upper eyelid crease incision. Use 10 nylon suture to do end-to-end -end cooptation. And then sometimes, um, you know, we wrap it also the amniotic membrane graft to protect this cooptation on neurography. Uh, and then this is to seal glue. The, the graft is then tunneled, as we talked about, and then um, buried in the uh, subtena and spleen here, and then subconjunctival around the limbus. And then you can cr create little pockets and then essentially uh, bury the uh, fascicles. Uh, here. I've modified this technique somewhat. I'll show you in the next uh, video, uh, but um, this is essentially kind of the principles of, of how we do the surgery. Uh, when we looked at uh, these patients and this average follow-up of um, six months, uh, the results were very similar to the, the uh, paper that was published by Gregory Borchel. Uh, the corneal sensation in these patients were slightly lower because these were more uh, uh, these were older patients, but uh, the stability of the uh, corneal epithelium was very very similar. Um, so so this uh, technique with nerve allograft also did show promise and showed evidence that um, this actually does work. Um, To further explore options for corneal neurotization um, and to potentially circumvent the, the downsides of using nerve grafts, such as you know, donor site morbidity or relying on a nerve graft for axonal regeneration, um, we thought about other options or other ways to perform minimally invasive uh, corneal neurotization uh, by using direct nerve transfers. And so, um, this was my first patient where we performed a direct nerve transfer through an upper eyelid crease incision. So you're, you're actually able to dissect out the entire uh, uh, donor nerve that you need for a transfer uh, through an upper eyelid incision. Uh, I used also a, uh, a small incision, uh, sagittal incision behind the uh, hairline that was about a centimeter to uh, put an endoscope in and then uh, allow dissection of the nerve. Uh, uh, that actually worked very well. And so the patient, this patient did uh, regain sensibility at three months and, and had uh, durable uh, corneal stability. Um, and so we'll, we've performed uh, more of these procedures uh, and uh, this paper uh, that we published in 2019 describes um, uh, 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 five eyes and four patients where we perform this direct transfer, all of these patients showing improvement in corneal sensation uh, and corneal stability. Uh, so this shows the uh, this, this technique. Um, so this is a upper eyelid incision uh, to harvest an ipsilateral supraorbital nerve to transfer directly uh, to the affected cornea. Uh, and I'm gonna 
maybe fast forward through some of that. So the dissection essentially is carried to identify the supraorbital nerve where it exits the foramen or notch. And then the nerve is dissected further cephalad in the uh, loose areola plane, so in subfrontalis plane on, on top of the periosteum. And you know, for um, ipsilateral transfer, you need about four centimeters of this nerve. And then any connective tissue fat is removed. And here, you know, you can see we isolated two branches of the nerve. Uh, and then uh, the nerve essentially is uh, tunneled medial to the uh, uh, medial horn of the levator muscle to the fornix, and then kind of buried in the subtenons and then subconjunctival uh, plane in a similar fashion as I showed earlier. And I not, uh, here, I, I performed a limited pyridomy around the limbus and secured the fascicles with uh, the seal of fibrin glue. Um, if a uh, longer length is needed, then you could use uh, endoscope. And here, actually, we're putting the endoscope with a kind of the brow lift sheath uh, 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 to tent the scalp through the eyelid incision. And then you can di dissect a uh, more distal branch and you need approximately eight to nine centimeters of this nerve to do the transfer. You can see this dissection and then this nerve can be uh, transected distally and then reflected inferiorly through this um, eyelid incision. You can see, you can get pretty good length. There's a couple of my patients have had this done. And then essentially uh, what happens next, you uh, thin it out and then you can transfer it to the contralateral side. And this shows um, after it's been transferred. And then uh, and this is, these are the branches of that same nerve before they are uh, covered by the conjunctiva. Um, another option uh, that has worked well, um, in patients who don't have intact uh, uh, V1 um, is, is direct uh, transfer of the infraorbital nerve. Now here, you know, you have to be careful and you don't want to transfer the entire infraorbital nerve and just transfer the selected uh, uh, branches of the nerve. And again, this isn't my first uh, choice, but in patients who don't have uh, any other options, uh, then this is a, or, or don't have a good option, uh, this, is a, this is definitely a, a, a possibility. Uh, this was just shows partial selective neurectomy and partial transfer of the uh, uh, branches of the infraorbital nerve directly to the cornea. So again, kind of similar idea and similar technique. I switched to using less sutures and more fibrin glue for fixation of the nerves around the eye. So uh, these techniques are very nice, but you know, let's talk a little bit more about clinical outcomes. So um, really what we want to see in these patients, um, uh, we want to see an improvement in corneal sensation. Uh, although I have to say that that's a surrogate measure. That's not, um, that, that, that usually correlates to success, but not always. Um, ideally, you know, we ultimately want to improve their vision. Although again, the corneal neurotization stabilizes the corneal surface and allows for secondary procedures to allow for vision improvement. So it may in itself not necessarily improve vision, but it, it, it will allow for, for example, someone to have corneal transplant or ha have a, a, you know, a, a cataract surgery, for example, where previously there weren't candidates for those. Um, we definitely want to see stability. So we want to see that the recurrence or persistence of PED uh, is, is uh, resolved or addressed. Uh, we talked about corneal transplant. We want to see that the morbidity of the surgery is minimal. Uh, we want to uh, look at cost effectiveness of the surgery. And so um, before, uh, before I left Duke, we uh, looked at uh, a, a, a lot of my patients. So we, we included uh, essentially 29 eyes of 28 patients for whom I performed this procedure, although I've done this already probably over 70, 70 cases, but these, these were the cases that uh, were included in the study because they met the inclusion criteria such as follow-up, et cetera. 
And so uh, uh, essentially we looked at those outcomes to see how these patients did. Uh, so uh, different techniques were used in the study. We used mostly, um, mostly the uh, uh, process norvalographs for indirect uh, transfers and then um, the the other uh, 10 eyes were performed, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, 11, I'm sorry, 10 eyes were performed with direct transfers and one eye was the coronal approach that I described earlier. So various donor nerves were used. Uh, 24 patients only made it to the statistical analysis, but um, uh, we did um, uh, obtain subjective uh, patient outcomes, such as kind of their subjective experience in all of the patients. And uh, median age was 60 years, median denervation time was 28 months, and uh, average uh, follow-up was uh, just over a year. Uh, as you notice, the stage was kind of were, were, were distributed towards stage one, stage two, although I had five patients in stage three of MK. So they, these are Mackey stages. So these are the outcomes. So 92% so of patients achieved improvement in ocular surface quality, meaning that you know, they, their persistent epithelial defect uh, 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 was uh, resolved, that their punctate epithelial erosions were improved, their corneal uh, new vascularization was improved, their tear film was improved. And, and these were evaluated with myself and uh, my cornea colleagues, colleagues, um, uh, including Victor Perez, that you you may know, um, the uh, the thirteen patients. So thirteen of these patients who've had PEDs uh, at their last at their follow up, uh, eleven of them did not have a PED, uh, and and have did not have a recurrence of PED. There were two who um, who did. Uh, now, interestingly enough, after the study, uh, one of these two patients uh, developed a uh, complete uh, resolution of his PED and maintained that throughout the next two years. So I think in this one patient, the, there was just delay in, in, in re -innervation. The other patient, unfortunately, did not and, and it required a Gunderson flap. So that's the only one patient really who did not respond uh, to the surgery. The uh, median improvement uh, of corneal sensation was uh, 2.3 centimeters. Uh, and we did not find a significant difference between either technique using nerve allograft versus direct transfer in terms of uh, corneal sensation improvement. There was a trend towards improvement in vision, but a lot of these patients have had some corneal scarring that required transplants. And three of those patients did undergo corneal transplants and which were all successful uh, uh, at, at their last follow-up. Uh, and then we also performed um, uh, in vivo confocal microscopy to look at re uh, in selected patients. And all of those patients did show evidence of re by in vivo confocal microscopy postoperatively starting between three and six months. So this shows kind of the, the uh, uh, a graph um, uh, looking at uh, uh, change in corneal sensation as a function of time. And you can see it kind of has this, this rectangular hyperbola uh, type of uh, function where the uh, corneal sensation uh, stabilizes at approximately a year and kind of remains relatively stable throughout at, at follow-up. So that's Pretty much what we see is that at, at about 12 months, uh, an average uh, patients uh, uh, reach kind of maximal uh, corneal sensation and improvement, and then they kind of stay stable. Now, that's variable. I've seen people who, uh, folks who had, did not have much improvement for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden started showing significant improvement, and these patients were denervated for you know, 10, 15 years. And then there are patients who have earlier plateau of their corneal sensation improvement. So this is just an average, but there's a wide distribution of the results. Another thing that there is also a subgroup of patients who do not show much corneal sensation improvement, but their ocular surface really improves and stabilizes. Um, and some of them, in fact, do report feeling the drops, uh, 
Uh, however, um, objectively, it's hard to detect improvement in corneal sensation. Uh, we also surveyed these patients and 17 patients completed the survey. They, great, you know, they reported their pain was, was relatively uh, mild uh, postoperatively, and most of these patients did not have a bothersome numbness in the distribution of their donor nerve. Uh, really, only one patient was bothered by it at one year. Uh, uh, and uh, paresthesia was also quite, quite minimal in these patients uh, in the area of, of donor nerve uh, harvest. And the majority of patients were very satisfied with their outcomes. And, you know, uh, interestingly, everybody said that they would do the surgery again if they had to do it over again. So uh, it's also kind of interesting. Some of the interesting uh, points here is that uh, there were um, a number of patients uh, who noted that they, they could feel the coolness of their eye drops. You know, most of these patients keep their eye drops in the fridge uh, and they could feel the coolness of the eye drops before any objective improvement in corneal sensation was noted. And then six patients had anesthesia where um, initially about three, three to six months after surgery, they felt uh, when the cornea was touched uh, or, uh, or when they had any sensation or contact with the cornea, they would feel, uh, feel um, uh, the sensation in their forehead where the daughter nerve was harvested from. That changed over a course of several months and then it was, they were able to map it, localize it to the cornea. Uh, this just shows these patients' characteristics. And the main thing here I want to point out is that uh, patients uh, had a very minimal uh, uh, adverse events. Um, there's you know this one treatment failure that we discussed, although this patient eventually succeeded. So really, there was just one treatment failure. Uh, and um, the one patient who had an infraorbital nerve uh, as a donor had delayed presentation of maxillary tooth abscess, which was successfully treated because of lack of uh, sensation in, in his cheek. These are some of the uh, outcomes. Um, this patient uh, is an older, older, elderly lady. She's 87. She came in with kind of a classic uh, MK with persistent epithelial defect due to herpes zoster, which been, uh, this, she had this PED uh, for over a year and a half. Uh, this is uh, five weeks after corneal neurotization. You can see closure of PED. This is a third, three months, and this is her 15 months maintaining corneal uh, integrity with no recurrence of PED. This is one of my patients, he's a younger kid, uh, was a five-year-old kid of, um, and uh, idiopathic onset of uh, MK, uh, treated for about three years since age of two for this uh, with persistent epithelial defect, every, at probably like 20 different places throughout the world. And finally it was referred and we performed a supraorbital direct corneal neurotization. This is him at uh, three years post-op. Three months afterwards, his, his PED closed, and eventually his scarring actually improved to the point where he has nearly normal vision in this eye. There's a little bit of amblyopia. That's his other eye, um, where we actually um, uh, did infraorbital neurotization as well. You can see improvement at six months. Uh, that's the patient I showed you earlier. Uh, this is another gentleman. This, this is an interesting case because this is one of the patients who I described that for two years showed minimal uh, to no improvement and then all of a sudden developed improvement in corneal sensation and improvement in, in, in his uh, epithelial integrity and, and surface. Uh, this is, uh, shows a successful corneal transplant at two years. Um, this is a patient who had a corneal explant of his neurotrophic cornea and simultaneous corneal neurotization. Uh, you show there's no corneal nerves, sustaining uh, of control for corneal nerves. So in his explant, there's no corneal nerves. This is at three months showing no nerves. And then at six months showing nerve, uh, early evidence of nerve regeneration. Uh, and this is showing um, uh, now healthy nerves within the stroma and subbasal uh, uh, area of the cornea uh, at one year. Uh, so um, I know we're running a little bit short on time. 
I'm just going to briefly go through this last study that we just uh, uh, submitted to British Journal uh, of Ophthalmology, which should be published hopefully soon. But this is looking at uh, our patients at Duke, um, uh, looking at Oxervate uh, uh, treated by uh, Dr. Perez and his, his group there, and cornea, cornea group there, and my corneal neurotization patients. And essentially, we looked at uh, we, we try to match these patients by their, by their uh, uh, comorbidities and their age. And we were able to find 15 patients in each group to, that we could match. And this is a retrospective study. Um, but we're looking, uh, we looked at corneal epithelial defect closure, a recurrence uh, rate of corneal epithelial defect, uh, patient satisfaction and cost uh, uh, consistency with patient expectations. This is their uh, demographics, very similar. There's more neurosurgical kind of intracranial etiologies for patients who underwent corneal neurotization. Otherwise, uh, otherwise the uh, characteristics were pretty similar. Um, <clears throat> so um, you can see that uh, uh, this is preoperative uh, and the uh, you know, majority of these patients had uh, epi defect without stromal thinning. And this is the, the black shows stromal thinning. You can see uh, all of these patients had uh, a persistent epithelial defect. And at three months, the neurotization showed uh, statistically uh, significant improvement in uh, closure of epithelial defect, whereas um, patients treated with Santa German uh, did not. Uh, at six months, again, corneal neurotization showed uh, further improvement you know, close to 80% improvement in the closure of PED, whereas Santa German showed uh, at this point only 40%. And then unfortunately it did not really improve with Santa German at one year. And then at one year, uh, the corneal neurization kind of maintained its outcome with 80% closure of PED in this, in this particular subgroup of patients. Uh, again, you know, this, these, this group of patients likely uh, I would not deem them as failure because again, it can take sometimes over a year to see improvement. And so if we were potentially to look, look at these patients, you know, a year and a half or two years from now, we probably would see that this gray uh, square would become a rectangle, I guess, would become even shorter. So, or, or potentially absent completely if all of these were successful. Uh, so rate of recurrence was also of persistent epithelial defect recurrence was also higher in patients with treated with Oxervate. And there was only one patient out of 11 who demonstrated recurrence of PED with corneal neurotization. Uh, and uh, also the amount of adjuvant therapies were much higher in patients who were treated with recombinant nerve growth factor. So higher cost uh, burden to the healthcare system with uh, with nerve growth factor drops. Uh, and most patients were more satisfied with corneal neurotization uh, surgery when questioned compared to Senate German. So um, the key take home point here is that corneal neurotization is an effective, safe, and definitive treatment option for neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, I think this is still in its infancy, and uh, as, as we learn more about it and other uh, you know, eye care physicians learn more about it, I think this will become the standard of care for this disease. I'm going to stop here. I have another few slides describing the um, uh, nerve surgery for pain uh, that in the paper that we published on that, but I think due to lack of time and, and, and um, uh, to allow uh, audience to ask questions, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, this is our contact information. Please my, use my cell to call, um, you know, if, if I could be of any resource or assistance or, or email. Um, so always available for, for anything we can do to uh, you know, further educate and, uh, about the surgery. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Can we give time for a few questions? Sure. Questions from the audience. There's probably 50 plus people here. So thank you. That's awesome. Questions from the audience? 
If not, I have a million for you myself, but I'll probably save those for, <laughs> I'll text you when I'm doing these. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so when someone's first starting to do these procedures, do they inter is, it, is it kind of a joint procedure with someone like a specialty like cornea or nerve surgery? Or when someone's first starting out, can they kind of approach these themselves? Yeah, did you hear that? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, I've done most of these myself, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's how uh, one should handle that uh, procedure. I think it just depends on expertise and comfort level. I, I certainly think that the team approach is excellent. You know, the, the limitation is that we're all very busy. Sometimes it's hard to coordinate these surgeries. And one of the limiting factors essentially really is the need for uh, combining multiple specialists to perform the procedure. And so, uh, you know, ideally, you know, you have someone who can offer most of these themselves uh, to allow for, to capture larger patients and, and to be more efficient. But I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's, it's just depends on your comfort level and uh, the desire to collaborate. So there's a question from the audience. I have a degree here, one of our neuro-ophthalmologists. Have you done confocal? I mean, let me see. Let me try to go back to confocal that. Confocal microscopy to look at the nerves. Yeah, have you done confocal microscopy to look at the nerves? Yes, yes. I actually showed that uh, earlier slide. I'll show you here. I'll go back. Uh, we've done actually a bunch, and this is just one of my patients. So this is a patient, uh, one of my patients, uh, who had actually an explant uh, so this is this denervated cornea. You can see there's no staining. This is a control. You can see these control the stains very nicely with PS uh, for uh, uh, corneal nerves. And this is the control. Now uh, the new this is the and this is the confocal microscopy of the new cornea. This is at three months. You see no evidence of renervation. This is at six months. You can see the kind of this one fascicle here. And then this is sort of a snapshot. And you can now start seeing healthy nerves in the anterior stroma. Now we have a number of patients who uh, had similar uh, outcomes uh, doing, you know, uh, confocal microscopy before and then uh, months after. We usually start seeing nerve regeneration at three to six months. There's been also probably at least five other papers uh, showing similar outcomes with, um, uh, you know, showing uh, showing nerves uh, within the stroma and subbasal uh, plexus region of the cornea. Other questions? Jeff. Ilya, it's Jeff Petty. Uh, just congratulations. This is, this is really extraordinary. You know, having seen patients with you know, you know, severe, you know, severe neuropathy and then not quite knowing you know, what to recommend, I'm curious now as you're receiving referrals, which patients are you recommending for Senna German versus uh, NK? Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you, Jeff, for your kind comments, by the way. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I think I don't think these are mutually exclusive uh, uh, treatments. I think I think that uh, Senna German is a adjunct treatment, just like autologous uh, serum tears, for example. But I don't, you know, in my experience, especially in patients who have central injuries to the trigeminal nerve, meaning, you know, neurosurgical injuries with irreversible trauma to the nerve, I don't think Sina German has a long-term role in terms of you know, definitive, definitively addressing the issue. So I think a lot of these patients um, uh, could benefit from both therapies. So I've had a number of patients who've had perioperative uh, uh, treatment with, with Sina German. So for example, they started two or three weeks prior and then we continue them throughout the treatment. Um, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, gathering these patients and publishing a report. I think I have about eight of these patients now. And so we're going to look at, at their outcomes comparing to the control who just had corneal neurotization. Uh, but I do think there's something to that. Um, and especially, especially maybe even uh, in patients who had partial denervation, you know, so those patients in, in you know, uh, ocular surgery or patients who've had, you know, herpes infections, because, there may be a role there for standard German to uh, improve nerve regeneration in those patients as well. Other questions? Yeah, I have one for you. So if, if all things are equal, what is your favorite approach now? What do you use? How do you do it? 
So my favorite approach now is for ipsilateral transfer, I do direct transfer of supraorbital nerve. Uh, and then for contralateral, I use a nerve graft. Um, you know, because it, I can do direct transfer with contralateral approach, but it just takes me longer. Uh, maybe I'm lazy, but I, I don't want to spend five hours in the OR. So now my, my procedures are, you know, uh, ipsilateral is about 30, 40 minute procedure. And then contralateral is about an hour. Um, so it's, they're actually relatively fast procedures. I mean, they're not like cataract surgery, but you can do them pretty fast um, with this with this approach. So again, thank you so very much. I look forward to seeing this for a very long time from you. I can't thank you enough. Any other questions before we let you go? Just uh, really to give a teaser about pain, doing it for pain. Can, can you like summarize that in one minute? Sure, yes. Um, I'm gonna just show one slide, okay? I, I know everyone has to go at private clinic or surgery at nine, but um, so um, there, there are really a uh, couple of types of patients that we deal with. You know, we deal with patients who, who have post-herpatic neuralgia or patients who have trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, these are uh, patients who have um, these recalcitrant pain that is very difficult to manage. And so what we've done for these patients is we've isolated the offending sensory nerves. So let's say in V1, these are generally uh, supraorbital, supratrochlear and infratrochlear nerves. So uh, you can see these here and we connected them together. So you create a closed circuit. So they're not firing you know, in the skin. And so they're, they're kind of talking to each other and that closed loop of, of circuitry kind of the, creates uh, um, a situation where the, the pain on the skin is now gone and, and uh, they just have numbness, but, but the, the pain is gone, right? And then for patients who have neuroma or traumatic pain, um, what I've done for these is removing the neuroma and then either re bridging the gap between the healthy distal nerve or proximal and proximal nerve or directly neurotizing the skin like we neurotize the cornea. And again, we published a paper on this, kind of uh, summarizing our outcomes in OPRS uh, just a few months ago came out. Um, and, and they're pretty remarkable outcomes. And then these patients were able to get off all kinds of drugs that they were previously on. Anyway, uh, I don't want to take up more of your time, but um, you know, if you do have a chance, you're interested, you want to look that up, um, you know, that kind of goes over details of the techniques and why we do it. Uh, and uh, what these patients can expect. Fantastic. Really, I think that's it. We'll let you go. I'm sure you have a very busy day. Thank you again so much. Thanks, Doug. And uh, look forward to catching up soon. Yeah, you too. See you later. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.